meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our God and our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Have a seat, please. I was tempted to uh, really get into the uh, epistle reading to the Ephesians. I just think from uh, all my years as an Episcopalian that that's usually a passage that we don't really get preached on because we feel that that spiritual warfare language, that militant language, that armor language, that soldiering language is best left for let's say, uh, other denominations who, who tend to not shy away from talking about these things. But let me just preface and say that it's clear to me, the older I get, it's clear to me that everything boils down to, everything boils down to, everything boils down to a spiritual that your marriage your parenting your finances the list goes on and on boil it down there are so many idols there are so many allegiances there are so many seductive forces at work to throw you off your game Paul is very concerned and I'm very concerned as a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ that there are not enough Americans today who are taking seriously the noise swirling around them and being able to decipher what is of God and what isn't. Jesus in the gospel passage this morning is getting down to grasp tax like he's never got down to brass tax before. And it gets lost in this summer reading in the lectionary when we're in this bread of life discourse in John. We've heard it now five, four or five Sundays in a row and we tune out. I'm telling you right now, this morning, that passage from the Gospel of John I just read to you is brass tax. Pick your metaphor where the rubber hits the room. Give me another one. Is that the only two metaphors we have? Brass tacks and where the rubber hits the road. Come on. Heart of the matter. Put up or shut up. Put up or shut up. Good one. Choose today who you shall serve. Yes. Now you're getting it. Now you're awake. Now you're not just ready to move on. You're right there. Jesus is calling us to a faith that is expressed in body, mind, and spirit. A faith that involves the whole person. A faith that cannot be confined to some little compartment of our lives, and that includes an hour and a half on a Sunday morning. I'll say that again. You ain't, I ain't doing what is pleasing to God. If I'm sitting here this morning, or if I'm preaching here this morning going through the motions, and I'm thinking about something else later on today. If I'm not, Grounded and in this moment thinking about what's really important in my life and where the blessings in my life come from. Jesus is calling us to as real a faith as you're listening to me right now preaching. Jesus is giving himself in this language. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, he's giving himself to us. That's why John's using this language. That's as totally in the language, that's as totally giving of something, my flesh, my blood. 
That's as real as it gets. And when we respond to Jesus Christ in faith, we do not just receive the gift of life from Jesus, we receive the gift of Jesus. His very life given fully to you and to me. And here it is. This is where it's the point of shut-up time. And the totality of his gift requires, my friends, the totality of our, of our lives. It is tragic but not surprising in the Gospels that there are so many who initially were attracted to his offer of life. Wow, that's a hell of a miracle you just performed. Woo! I'm thinking I'm going to hang with you for a while. And then, he looks at them and says, okay, now who is really with me? What do they say? Ah, Lord, this teaching is just too difficult. Who can handle it? And the gospel says, many went away. It's the same in 2018. This church and every Christian church in this, I'll make it the world, I was just going to say just in America, if we took seriously as Christians what our master says to us, every Christian church on the planet People should be out the door. It's the same today as it was back then. People, myself included, making choices, making excuses, until, right, I'm in a pickle. Until I turn into that praying disciple of Jesus only when I need something. And not daily immersing myself in prayer, which, by the way, Paul says is the weapon of all weapons. That's why we're a praying church. I don't care what anybody says about a good shepherd because we got we got a lot going on, but we got a lot to improve on. But I'm telling you what. I love this church, and I love the fact that we're a praying church. That corner over there during communion is filled with disciples of Jesus who want to pray for you, and not just on Sunday mornings. We've got so many other prayer ministries here. Not going to go into it. We are a praying church, and the devil hates that. The devil hates that we are a praying church. He would much rather us just go through the emotions or the motions, just, and the emotions probably, it's safe to say. God in the person of Jesus Christ came to give us life, not just life, but abundant life. He says, just as the Father has sent me and I live because of the Father, whoever eats me will live because of me. This is life that is so much more than merely existing. This is being drawn into an experience of God being drawn into a lived experience of the relationship, a relationship with the Trinity itself. He says it, you eat my flesh and drink my blood, I abide in you and you in me. This is relational. Not just Sunday morning time. Not just when your favorite team doesn't win. It's alright to smile because I prayed many a prayer. Oh Lord, why? <laughs> it's relational. You would not shirk your relationship with those you love like you and I shirk our relationship with God if we're honest. And this is not a detached question of whether or not we have received this or that. This is about an ongoing participation in the life of God through the person of Jesus Christ about our continual need to receive His life and to abide in Him. This is about living our life 
wholly and fully for him, body, soul, spirit. It is, to quote our theme for our capital campaign, it is all for Jesus. When I reflect on what I shared with you at the beginning, that anecdote about John McCain being shot down in Southeast Asia and being captured, and when his captors found out that his dad was a rear admiral, he said, oh, ooh, I think we need to let this one go. And when they approached him and said, we're going to let you go. And when he said, you're not letting, I'm paraphrasing, you're not letting me go anywhere unless you let my brothers, I think they were safe to say, well, most of the men in Vietnam were all men in the front lines. But I know this because uh, we have a, a wonderful woman here. She's now over in the retirement community in uh, Portland. Her name is Sue Griffin. She used to live, live at Fairway Village. And Sue Griffin was a nurse was a nurse in the United States Army during the Vietnam War, and she was, of course, back in the in med medevac uh, tents. And she shared with me what that was like. So I know the women were back, the nurses, and they were back in the tents when they were bringing the bodies back. When I think about what all for Jesus looks like, or to put a little twist on the phrase, because I think Adidas of North America uses the phrase all in, Right? David, is that correct? Is that Adidas or is that Nike? Adidas. Thank you, you dumb. Go dogs. <laughs> when I think about what all in looks like, I know Adidas can't do this, but I would just show a commercial of John McCain. And if someone says, well, how can you say that? How? You just tell them the story that I, I learned about. Because he said to his captors, I ain't going nowhere. You let every one of my brothers go, and then I'll be released. And his decision to not take them up on their offer led to five years of captivity. How many of us in this room would have it in us to be able to say what he said to his captors? And that's not even getting into what his faith is. I don't even know what he is. That's just his belief in being an American and being honor and duty and country. And anybody who's ever served the United States military knows the military, the United States military, does a way better job of getting its soldiers to all in, and the church does a lousy job of it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> the church lets us get away with, we let you get away with everything. We let you get away with, you come whenever you want. We let you get away with, you give whatever you want. We let you get away with, Time to put up or shut up. Because God needs us now more than ever. God needs us to lean into this capital campaign now more than ever. And I'm not saying, listen to me, I'm not saying you've got to give your hard earned money as much as the person next to you. All you've got to do is give what you can give. But if you're called to shepherd your church, if you, to, if you expect this body of Christ to be there for you, hook, line, and sinker, like it always usually is, not always, but we try, then you and God got to figure out, are you all in, or are you just window shopping? Because that's the brass tacks that Jesus is getting down to. Oh, we're... We're, we find this so difficult to do, Jesus. Oh. And I love Simon Peter's response. It echoes through the ages. 
Jesus looks at him and he looks at us right now and he goes, where are you going to go? Are you going to go across the street to that church? Are you going to go to that church? Are you going to stop going to church because you've got a laundry list of all the reasons why churches are hypocritical and are homophobic and are judgmental and you don't need that in life? Whoever promised you and me that the church is going to be this hunky-dory place? My goodness, people, when human beings are bumping up against each other and causing friction, there's always going to be conflict. There's always going to be doubt. There's always going to be... Where are you going to go, he says. What does Simon say? Lord, where are we going to go? You're the one who shows us the way. You're the one who has eternal life. You're the one, as I've lost my husband, and I cry out in the middle of the night because I miss him so very much, or I miss my wife so very much. You're the one who comforts me. Not the bottle, not Ambien, not some self-help book on how to breathe properly in America today. The promise. You come to this altar rail and you put out your hand and you receive my flesh and you receive my blood and I will dwell in you and you in me. I want us to commit because we are in and on the verge of the biggest month in the history of this parish in the last 25, 30 years. When Bob Rhodes and Bob Schaefer and the vestry of Good Shepherd Church 30 years ago looked at each other and said, we're not going to be able to build this sanctuary that we're in right now because we don't have enough money. The Holy Spirit inspired Bob Schaefer to come up with the idea to approach the Public Utilities Commission, the PUD, and to propose that they buy that parcel of land where the substation is. PUD couldn't believe it. They were looking for a substation in this neck of the woods. Bob Schaefer said, we'll sell it to you. They sold it, and that $750,000 was the seed money along with all the generous people who call this home to build this incredible and beautiful sanctuary. September 23rd, we are going to announce how much we have raised towards 3.2, I'm rounding it off, $3.2 million to do what? If you are sitting there and have no idea what that money is going towards, shame on you. We have talked about it for three years. There are vestry members around the church to talk to. We have blasted it in emails. We have schematics around the church. You know where my office is. If you have any thoughts, concerns, or questions still before the 23rd of September, you need to come and see me. I will try to answer them for you. Where else are we going to go? Where else are we going to go? Here I am, Lord. Send me. <laughs> <laughs>